ruptures very quickly. And if you have a child like that, then you need to do what the doctor said. Because once it gets over 103, you know, that's serious. And some children just are that way. They, they'll spike a temperature that, and it goes right to 103. And once you get up that far high, you, you're talking about, you know, even brain, brain damage. So, you know, if it gets higher than that, yeah. most adults, you might spike a temperature, you know, a hundred or 101. Um, but there are some children that, and it's, it's almost like a genetic thing that their parents probably got very high temperatures at children as children and their children. Well, so these are things too, you know, being acquainted with your health history, knowing what your family's health history was, because there can be some predispositions to things yep. and it's important to know that. And what about, you know, not necessarily avoiding the cold virus and trying to protect. Wash from... your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Yeah. But That's about... simple. Not with antibacterial soap. Antibacterial soap, they find, they're talking about, it has actually carcinogenic properties. Remember what I said, 10 minutes on you know in your in on your skin, skin ten minutes in your bloodstream. Yep. So we are inundating these children with antibacterial this and that, and this, and they're finding there was a wonderful program on I think Nova Special or Nova Now about bacteria. We need bacteria on us in us in order to maintain health. There's a bacteria that is is nurtured or fed by breast milk that actually helps the digestion of a newborn. So there, there's a lot of things that, you know, we're so germophobic in this country. And, you know, the ger- well, the bacteria, the good bacteria that are all over our skin are protecting us from the, the uh, what you call opportunistic bacteria, mm-hmm. like MRSA, that just will take over. They're, they they replicate very quickly. If they have a clean area with no other bacteria, they take it over. And we need a certain amount of bacteria in in our gut and in our body. It the um, the off products of the bacteria actually help our health. They are doing a study now with the Amish children don't get sick. They have the same vaccines. They have the same health care as regular children. They rarely get sick. And they're actually studying the Amish barn dust because they think that the children are actually exposed to bacteria that are healthy and helping them maintain their health. So we've gone clean crazy in this country thinking we got to get rid of all the germs and all the bacteria. And actually what we're creating is ill children. So would you recommend as an alternative something that boosts an immune system? Well, not necessarily. Um, Eating um, foods that are fermented is helpful. Yogurt with live culture in it is helpful. Mm -hmm. You don't want things that are pasteurized. Um, And, you know, if a child eats a little handful of dirt, it's not going to kill them. You have to eat a peck of dirt before Before you you die, Yes, that was an adage we grew up with. (laughs) Yes. I don't, now they, God forbid, you know, I mean, my, my mother never Lysoled our toys. We brought them in. If they were muddy, they got rinsed off and put into the bin, you know. But but it is important, especially when there's a lot of sickness. And having worked in um, as, in a social as a social worker yeah. in the medical field, wash your hands before and after eating, before and after going to the bathroom. See, people don't wash their hands before. But that you need to, especially if you've been working with animals or other people. So before and after going to the bathroom and before and after contact with other people. Yep. So, you know, it's very important to wash your... And children will say, my hands aren't dirty. Look, I don't need to wash them. No, go wash your hands. We're eating dinner. Yeah, I was definitely one of those kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're clean. They're, look, they're yeah. clean. And then they or were I probably washed, obviously dirty. <laughs> or I washed them already. Yes, that was before you pet the dog. Now go wash your hands again before you eat because you don't want to ingest bad microorganisms. Mm-hmm. Or touch your eyes. You know, people have – I love it when people count money and they lick their fingers. Do you realize what you're ingesting? Yeah. <laughs> It's horrifying. <laughs> and then, so what about like, um, do you do anything with, in regards, uh, or we're talking about the different ways we're consuming these herbs. Mm-hmm. 
you know, we, we talked about uh, the teas, the tinctures. What about cooking with them? Is there anything? Oh, you... there's definitely a benefit with cooking with herbs. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Anything you recommend? You know, even you know, we can commonly grow in our yards that you oh, know you have a lot thyme, of benefits. Thyme, oregano, um, they all have antimicrobial properties. Lavender does. There's uh, things that there's things that'll help boost the immune system. It's not you can grow astragalus around here. It's in the vetch family, um, but. It's um, I I haven't had good success. Some people have, but yeah. using you can get uh, they call slices of astragalus root, and no matter how long you cook it, it never softens up so you can chew it. It's always very woody. But you can put it if you're making a big pot of soups or stews. You can put that in um, as an immune enhancer. People, though, with autoimmune illnesses have to be careful because their immune system is working against them, and you don't want to take things like echinacea on a regular basis. Or uh, You have to be careful if you're using anything that's an immune enhancer, you know, strengthens your immune system because that could work against you. And let me just say something about echinacea. You don't want to use echinacea every day. There's a lot of products out there. You know, have echinacea, you take it all through the winter. No. Echinacea, you only take it for 7 to 10 days. And we're talking about the... The, the plant, coneflower. Yes, right. purple coneflower. Yeah. Yes, echinacea. Okay. And there's Augustifolia, which grows, I think, more out west. But around here, it's mostly the papura. Yeah. And there's a lot of different varieties. Um, but the purple coneflower is probably the more traditional variety. Right. And then and how do you how do you, what do you put it in? You would make a tincture or okay. you make a tea. Usually you use the root, but there there's a company that I deal with that uses the uh, whole plant, including the seed and the root, to make their tincture. Hmm. So you can grow echinacea yourself and then use it for teas. It's not a bad tasting tea. You can add it to things. Which brings up a point. A lot of times people want to combine a bunch of stuff. You know, well, I read that this, this, and this, and this is good for what I'm having a problem with. And the problem with that is then you don't know what works. Yeah. So I think it's sometimes better to start off with one or two things and see how you do. And if that's not working, maybe try something else. But, you know, if you take a lot of everything, you don't know what's really helping you. So... Anyway, but echinacea, you don't want to take every day. You want, if you get sick, if you're starting to feel sick, you start taking it. And I usually use the tincture, and I'll take it every couple hours. So echinacea is used as a, an immune booster. Immune booster, yes. And the purpurea that we, we buy and grow mm-hmm. around here, once you get a good stand going, yeah. it'll reseed itself. Yes. And you can harvest. you can harvest your own roots. Yeah. You know, you, when you're dealing with uh, perennial uh, roots, it's usually a perennial plant. You don't want to harvest it every year because the plant needs to, and you don't want to harvest it the first year. You probably every three years, some or every five years. because And you always leave some roots so the plant can replenish itself. Oh, wow, what a plant. I mean, Len, usually our conversations around echinacea is all about the pollinators. Yes, yes. It's, yes. Uh, and that's you know, another aspect. Huh? It's wonderful for the pollinators. A great native pollinator. Yes. Yes. yes, it's a good friend to have. Yes, it's a wonderful garden plant, and you can't have too many. Awesome. And it also, if you have, you know, it's interesting, places where they actually grow a cluster of it. Yeah. They can really, you know, echinacea is fine as a single plant because it gets quite robust and full. But if you actually have, a, you know, three or five or seven plants in an area, and they all come, I mean, it's it just it's spectacular. Yeah. My front yard, I got tired of mowing it, so I planted a pollinator garden. Good. And there are exactly that. There's just a, a whole section that's got echinacea, different colors, and they're mm-hmm. all the whites, the purples, the yellows. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. all seed. They seed themselves. Mm-hmm. But it come in August, I want you to see my garden in August. A lot of people want to hide their gardens in August. Yeah. I want you to see my yeah. front yard yeah. in August. It's absolutely gorgeous. And that, that's another thing, like goldenrod. Goldenrod is yeah. great for allergic reaction to ragweed. Everybody, whenever they talk about ragweed on the news, they show a picture of goldenrod. That is the antidote. And goldenrod is great for the pollinators. It's one of the last forages. And there's like 22 different kinds of goldenrod. 
I have all kinds coming up in my yard and I let it grow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people, they always saw it as like a weed or, but it, it's a wonderful plant. And it, and you have a stand of goldenrod. It's, that's another spectacular plant. And you harvest it and then you, ingest yes, it to become the Yes, antidote? you can go and pick some fresh flowers and make a tea with it or you can harvest it and dry it and have it. But that, that's a good uh, ragweed. And ragweed is a nondescript plant that has a nondescript flower that makes all our lives miserable. And may I bring up, ragweed is wind-pollinated. That's why we have, have the allergies yes. to it. Yes. And goldenrod is pollinator, uh, pollinated yes. by bees. Yeah. So you can actually stick your nose and rub it in goldenrod, and your nose will come up, your whole face will come up yellow. But the pollen sticks yeah it's it's not causing the yeah. the uh allergic reaction it's ragweed they've also found that pollen depends on the size and shape too because there's different shapes and how they um adhere themselves to the hairs in your nose and that can cause yeah. aggravation and pretty soon you know everybody as soon as the the um the snow is gone Come probably by the middle to end of March, people start having allergy problems. It's trees, trees tree right. pollen. And one that people have a lot of issues with is actually pine. And they don't, they don't even know that the pine trees are pollinating, but they are. What, what are some common things you can use to, I don't know, maybe lessen or manage? Nettle, nettle tea. Start If you're going to use... Um, I. I also have used bee pollen, actually taking capsules, or you can buy local bee pollen and ingest that every day. I think it's a tablespoon of, of uh, uh, raw native honey um, a day will help counteract that. Um, I also, there's a definite link between allergies and your immune system. Mm -hmm. And I recently, a couple of years ago, had a health crisis. And after I got better, I found my allergies were better. And I think my immune system is stronger now. So if that's another indication. So a lot of times people, as they get older, they never had problems when they were younger. And now they are starting to have more problems. Women, menopause is a very disruptive time uh, physiologically. And a lot of things that they never had an issue with before are suddenly an issue. And one of them could be allergies. Um, so actually growing up as a kid, I never had any allergies. Yeah. And when people would tell me they had allergies, yeah. I thought they were making it up. Yeah. Um, but now I'm, I'm starting to get, yes. you know, some yeah. seasonal, yeah. you know, congestion and headaches and stuff like that. There's and, another thing that another plant that grows around here is called marshmallow root. It's a perennial. Well, we, the medicinally we call it marshmallow root. We use the root, but it's a perennial that grows in damp areas. It's a very pretty perennial. And um, that is good for mucus secretion. So when you have a lot of post-nasal drip, because this is another problem. When you have allergies, you get a lot of post-nasal drip. Yeah. And some of it goes to your stomach and can cause stomach upset, especially with children. And some can go into your lungs and cause a bacterial infection. So uh, marshmallow is very good at helping drying that up. The only problem with it is if you have blood sugar problems, it could push your blood sugar up. So people who have a high blood pressure blood sugar can't use it but there's other things like elderflower blooms in uh, i think june beginning mm -hmm. of june and that elderflower that elderberry mm -hmm. that sambucus yeah. let me yeah. tell you but the elderflower itself will help dry up the, the secretions too yeah. you make a tea with the flower so the, we use both two parts of that plant and by the way that that marshmallow is marshmallow mallow, mallow. excuse me but but actually that's where the Ma Marla. Well, anyway, that's well, I've story. heard that too. I'm not so sure, but yeah. <laughs> but um, it's the hibis the eight, uh, uh, American Beauty's native hibiscus. Yes, it's, it's a the mallow. same thing. It's a mallow. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And yeah. so it's available in your garden center <clears throat> at Mackey's, like the dinner plate hibiscus. The dinner. Well, it it that is a cultivated uh, uh, cousin, but if you if you bought it. In the American Beauty's native plant collection, yeah, that is the uh, Machutus. That's a that's a mallow also. Yes, and the mallows, if you break a leaf and you you either put it in your mouth or uh, squeeze it, it's very mucilaginous. Yeah. And what that means is it's kind of thick and slippery. Yeah, and um, so they the, all the mallows. That's a quality that the mallows have 
in 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 common. And you would just use and, the leaves and yeah, you can make dry a tea with the leaves. You could just you could use them. You could use them fresh if you have to. I just put more in. You know.